Welcome to a special edition of The Point of View. Today is the day the former president of Ghana, His Excellency J. John Rawlings, uh, was laid to rest. So we have a special tribute show for you. It's going to be interactive. You, have, you can send us your thoughts and your wishes about Rawlings to us on the WhatsApp number we'll put on the screen. And of course, if you're watching on any of the social media platforms, please get in touch. So coming up today, I'll be speaking to different people. I'll be speaking to the former Eastern Regional Minister, former Minister for Employment, who was a leader of the ACDRs. He's called Honorable Intubuesiaku Setre. He's joining me to talk about Rawlings, the Rawlings he knew. Then I'll spend a large part of the show talking to Alaji Hudu Yaya. He read the tribute for the NDC at the program. Alaji was a former Northern Regional Secretary of PNDC, he later on became the first General Secretary of NDC. He's also joining me in studio. And then the last bit of the show, I'll speak to Winfred Osei, who incidentally used to work with Alaji Hudu Yaya. He was the first Deputy Propaganda Secretary of the party, also was in the CDR. So it's going to be a long uh, one and a half hour show. Please sit tight. And we also have some nice bits from the uh, program that happened earlier today, plus some very interesting footage of Rawlings. Stay with us. day to meet every challenge. It's a good day to want more out of life. It's a good day to wish for it, work for it, go get it. Familiar taste, a delicious indulgent with a flavor you just can't hide. Refreshing energy, gives so much for so little. For a strong performance, you've come to the right place. Good day energy drink. Why wait a minute to enjoy a good day when every second counts? Good Day Energy Drink keeps you going. Excessive drinking can be detrimental to your health. Not recommended for persons under 18 years, lactating mothers, pregnant women, and people sensitive to caffeine. This advertisement has been vetted and approved by the FDA. Welcome back to The Point of View. So, Ghana's longest-serving leader who ruled the country for 19 years, His Excellency Flight Lieutenant Jerry John Rawlings, retired, died on November 12, 2020, having served as a head of state both in the military sense and in the civilian sense. Tonight, we're going to show you some of the interesting things we know about him, talk to some people who were close to him, and give you some level of closure now that he's been finally laid to rest. I'll start with uh, an actor, Akofa Jani Asiedu. She put together her own short ode or tribute to H.E. Jerry John Rawlings. This is what she, she sent through to us. My elder and kinsman, your beard has reached its maturity, so you are an ancestor. When I offer drink to the deserving visitors, I shall invite you among the host. Your favorite songs are being played all over the world. Yet your limbs do not respond. We are denied even a nod. For those who did, and for those who did not understand you, you are ancestor to all. The guns are silent. The metal beds seem to harm a ditch for you. Ranger of the skies, where now you have found your space. Oh, Baba. Baba. Baba, Tata. 
wa wale wale weto to wa gamu papa ji he de mi said we will papa ji so that was a uh, actor akofa jani a serious tribute to chairman rollings let me start with uh, in Chibwe Siako Setra, Honorable, he's a former minister of many portfolios, former Eastern Regional Minister, former Minister for Employment, at some point chairman of the CADA group. He went through the funeral earlier. Uh, good to have you, sir. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, it must have been a difficult day for you and your friends. Really, very devastating day. Mm. Ever since we heard of the sad news, we have been really, really devastated. We have been trying to put ourselves together and have a, a bit befitting barrier. Today we are satisfied that the thing was so solemn. It was so nice and everything went so so well. Mm. So that is one side of it. Satisfying that we have had a, a rest for our hero, our leader. Your founder. And our founder. Amazing. Just personally, when was the first time you met him? Tell me a bit about your association with him. Mm, the first time I met him, you see, when the revolution was launched, mm -hmm. I was in Nigeria. Okay. But I had an encounter during the AFRC time. Okay. So when the 31st December revolution was launched, my comrades and friends asked me to come down and lend support. So I came and joined the Committees for the Defense of the Revolution, which was actually the vanguard for the prosecution of the revolution. And I joined in the Eastern region, where I did a lot of work. I rose from ordinary cadre to become a head of department, and later become the, the regional organizer system for CDRs in the Eastern region. So that gave me a lot of opportunity to meet closely with the leader of the revolution. Well, we're meeting once a month in an expanded cabinet where the regional PNDC regional secretary and the PNDC regional organizer assistant will come from the regions to meet at the center for us to deliberate on a lot of policies and programs that have come on. So I had a, a lot of time meeting with the leader. So this CDR became a core part of the philosophy of the PNDC. Yes. So is it the idea that leadership is bottom up so that ordinary people should be in government? What is this? Because I've heard a lot of you say you were KDS, CDR. What is that whole idea? <laughs> yeah, the, I, I said that the KDS were the vanguard of the revolution. Indeed, if we bring it to this dispensation, that, that will be the party of the government okay so being the head of it in the eastern region we had a lot to do with ordinary people and we see that the key principle of the our leader was giving power to the people and therefore a bottom-up mm. approach where the aspirations and the ideals of the people were brought up through the the cdr concept to the top mm. and then filtering down what the leadership was saying to them. So why we saw that the CDR did a lot of things. Mm. In fact, we had some departments, monitoring and coordination department, which was monitoring what was being done in both at the workplaces and the communities. We have the projects and programs, doing communal labor within the communities and bringing programs and projects we also had <clears throat> uh, we also had arbitration, abicom, mm -hmm. where ordinary people cannot assess court, but mm. had a lot of issues came to the CDA and they were adjudicated in a manner that technicalities were not involved, but they were settled for them to really feel appreciated. So those were the things which brought the ordinary people so close to the founder, mm. uh, to the leader. Is that why the, the cadres were so close? I remember in the past few years, I've seen you at programs, 
KDAP programs where he attends or there's some of his events, then he, and you are a speaker there. I see Ben Kumbo, sometimes Martin Amidu. So it seems to me, if, because don't forget that he's, in his last days, he wasn't such a key political actor. He became more of a statesman. Yeah. And guys like you were always around him for his events. Is it that it was reminding you people of the early days or what? Why are the Kedas so dear to him? And why were you guys always with him? Well, uh, the Kedas were really the people who were trained and ideologically to be with him on his principles and values. So clearly, as the vanguard of the revolution, we constantly updated ourselves through workshops, through uh, training and uh, development. So we had what was dear to the man. Mm. So when we transited into constitutional rule, the CDS became an association. Okay. So we call Association of the Committees for the Defense of oh, the Oh, so C A CDR became ACDR, ACDR, an association. Yeah. So okay. he became the life patron <laughs> okay. of the association. Okay. So clearly, general CDR cadres were really having affinity and closeness with him. Mm. And who were the leaders of the CDR mm. at the time? I see. And that is why always Kung Wo, some Gaba, some Pia they are all always all part of the, the, all the part of it. I want to show viewers something. There's a, a, a video somebody sent me of Rawlings in Togo for an OAU summit. So this one, he was in military attire. I just want to show you that because I, I, I like him to explain to us a bit the charisma, the popularity. And, and this is not the 70s, this is a bit later. So let's just... Uh, fly that that video mm -hmm. and then I'll, I'll take a comment on it That was uh, from Togo Television, Rawlings. Do you, do you recall this? Well, I, might not, I was not there, mm -hmm. but I really have affinity with it, I associate with it. Mm. In the revolution, throughout the whole West African sub region, anywhere Rawlings went, the Guyanians there will, will embrace him together with other nationals, especially even the, the country's nationals. And they held him. Mm. It was really from Nigeria that they started calling him Junior Jesus. Oh, it was Nigerians who started yes. calling him Junior Jesus for JJ. JJ, Junior Jesus. Wow. JJ, do something before you die. JJ, <laughs> do something before you die. He was so close to ordinary people. And the aspirations and concerns of ordinary people was his champion. Wow. And therefore, whenever and wherever he went and they saw him he will go to them we are told he was very close to thomas sankara yes I'll, I'll put thomas sankara's picture on the screen shortly but what do you know anything about that relationship and why they were so close because in fact he named a mm -hmm. place tankara circle yeah, after he uh, was killed uh, yes that area not too far from ridge mm -hmm. what was his relationship with sankara like you see he was already a revolutionary leader in Ghana before Sankara came to the scene. And if I have watched, and because of his popularity and his, uh, his endearment to the ordinary people, any person came, coming to Lamb Lab in West Africa at that time wanted to have a meeting or a sharing ideals with him. And Sankara was a very young man. So he wanted to 
really get Rollins to impart some of his charisma and his way of doing things. So they became buddies. And, that, and, and they were both soldiers, both young soldiers. Young soldiers who were leading countries. Mm. And that's why when he died impromptu by I mean, an insurgent within his own thing, that's why Rollins named the, 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 uh, that circle to him. I, I wrote in his book that a lot of the African coup people, when they did a coup, they wanted to come and greet Rollins from Valentine Strasser to Yaya <laughs> Jame. And it, it, it was a period that it was, it was, he wasn't getting tired. You hear that something has happened somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost like he's the... I, I don't know. Is that, is that true that a lot of the revolutionaries and military people in all these other African countries sort of looked up to him in some sense? Within the sub-region, yes, they did. Why is he himself, if you remember? He too had Castro... When in 1979, after he had done the uh, house cleaning, exercise, he went to Cuba to see Castro. In fact, he was also very close to uh, the Sandinistas. So clearly, I mean, the revolutionaries, when they come to power, they want to share ideas and ideals and be able to govern by the principles that they, 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 they espouse. And that's why... And surely, Rollins, when he came to power, but he said something, let me tell you. He said, taking power is not as difficult as holding it. You can make a coup and take power, but you can't hold it. But he held on at least to 11 years. How, how was he able to keep power for 19 years? He will tell you that <laughs> it is because we are doing what the people want. But there were coup cool attempts. Oh, so, yes. Plenty. After attempts, you see, people who have been exploiting the ordinary man over a long period of time have their own class interests. So they tell us that these are the wrong people doing the right thing. <laughs> they are. So you have, is this a class issue now? So, at that time, and in fact, this, this is still. Because if you, if you go and work for somebody, the proprietor and you as a worker, your interests are not the same. Mm. Even though you wish that the, the organization will try so that you'll get your salary. But the proprietor wants more profits. Mm. So the two of you, your interests are not the same. So when ordinary people come to power, the aristocrats, the rich, and privileged in society are not happy. So they will attempt to remove you. And that, that is not just within the country. They, we have the comprador class who are linking with their masters outside the country. So they will attempt to remove you by coup or whatever. And that's why you said that taking power is not as difficult as holding it. Let me just give you even an example within constitutional rule. Mm -hmm. Donald Trump took power. But was he able to hold it? <laughs> After four years, he had to relinquish it. Mm. So clearly, that was what he meant, that taking power is not as difficult as holding it. You can only hold it when you are doing what the people want. And the people will be your protector. Mm. And that's why uh, Rollins was able to go everywhere and deal with himself with people, ordinary people. Interesting. Mm. Some people say he, 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 he became disenchanted with his own party because if you listen to some of his rhetoric in the latter days, he, he, he felt, he claims the party has lost its principles and that they had lost their true north. So if you're, I'm not sure if the, and today's not discussion about NDC, but mm -hmm. I'm, I don't know what he thought about the current state of our politics and the kind of politics we do compared to the kinds of things he used to talk about in the early 80s. It's almost like from idealism to realism. No, he has never changed his principles. Honestly, principles cannot be changed. They are set rules which are there. The Labour Party was formed over 100 years ago, but they, they still have their own principles. You know, even in Cape Coast, if you remember, Cape Coast in 2016, at our Congress, he said, don't mimic the MPP. 
stay onto your own principles and values, which I help you. And if you do that, we will continue to win for a long time to come. If you change, if you want to mimic them, if you want to copy them, then you will lose. Clearly, if we stay on our principles, we will rule this country for a long time. Because let me tell you, there are more ordinary people than rich people. So if the concerns of the ordinary people is what you are standing on, and they believe that you are doing what they want, you will continue to rule, because they are more liberals than professors. <laughs> so I see. clearly, he was warning us that we shouldn't shift. Okay, let me end your segment by showing you Nana Kufuado's um, tribute. Um, some people think that the evolution of Rawlings can be captured in the way his tumultuous relationship with somebody like Akufuado ended up in such a close relationship. So just, just watch some of the things he said, and then I'll take your comment. For all his revolutionary antecedents, he set in 2001 the enviable precedent which has since guided our country of respecting the two-term limit of the presidency and superintending the orderly transfer of power to his democratically elected successor. Whilst he was with us, he respectfully declined an offer I made to him in 2017 to have the University of Development Studies Tamale, UDS, which he personally helped establish, named after him. His reason was that, in adhering to a long-standing principle, he did not want to have any national monument or facility named after him. Two days after his passing, at the 21st Congregation of UDS, I expressed my strongest convictions, in spite of his reservations, that such an honor should be accorded him. I am glad that this has found favor with his family and the necessary formalities will be carried out to achieve this. That is, the Jerry John, Ra Jerry John Rawlings University of Development Studies, Tamale. Such is the measure of the man that the days associated with his political intervention in Ghanaian history, i.e. 15th May, 4th June, 31st December, and 7th January, are now significant days in the calendar of the nation. But the most significant of them all must be 7th January 1993, the day that ushered in the Fourth Republic. It is in recognition of this that I decided to commemorate 7th January as Constitution Day on the national calendar. It is perhaps the greatest tribute a grateful nation can offer to the men and women whose efforts led to the establishment of the Fourth Republic. It is my hope and prayer that he remains forever the longest serving head of state in our nation's history. For that would mean that the Fourth Republican Constitution and its enshrined term limits have endured. His actions were not limited to Ghana only. The African nationalist that he was, he held unwavering positions on all matters concerning the wider continent of Africa, especially when they involve foreign interference and control of Africa's destiny. Were you surprised at the warmness of the president's um, tribute to Rawlings? <laughs> I, I was not surprised because we have been going to Rawlings since uh, 2017. He has been telling us. But when I say we, the leaders of the cadres, and he has been telling us 
Tata Kubalu came to him and they discussed issues. And it is not that, and he has, been, he has said it publicly, it is not that he loves a Kubalu. But he thinks that he must be given a chance to do. Because he has won elections and he has to. He is a statesman. So he cannot say because of one or two things, they are doing something, he will not go. But that does not change his principle. His principles cannot change. If you want to change, if you are changed and want him to come to your side, he will not. Because as I've already said, principles cannot change. Today, almost everybody in this country is saying probity, accountability, transparency, and truth. Thank you for talking to us. We wish you well. Commiserations to you and the, the, the Keda family. This is still the point of view. A special show for Rawlings. When we come back, we'll be speaking to Alaji Hudu Yaya. We'll also be speaking to some other interesting people who were associated with Rawlings. Stay with us. Welcome back. This is still the point of view. It's a special tribute show for former President His Excellency Jerry John Rawlings, who was buried earlier today. So we've um, shown you a few excerpts of the, the funeral. We've spoken to Nchibuye Siakon, the leader of the Kedes at some point. Now, I want to show you something else before I do an interview. I'm going to take you into the funeral because there were quite a number of um, tributes read. In fact, before I even do it, let me just show you the... This is by far the biggest funeral brochure I've seen in my journalism life. Almost 300 pages. We will show you some of the, the tributes in there. It's a compendium. If, if, uh, if they sell it, buy one and keep it in your bookshelf and let your kids read it. It's, it's amazing. Absolutely beautiful work. Um, let me bring in... Um, the first general secretary of the NDC, who's also, interestingly, the former secretary for trade, former secretary for parts of the northern region. He was a secretary for mobilization and Kedar affairs many, many years ago as a young man. He was also the one privileged to have read the NDC's tribute. Alaji Hudu Yaya is joining me. Alaji, good to see you. Thanks for, thanks for being here. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I always say to those who come, commiserations and condolences to you. Thank you. Um, it must have been a difficult and tough day for you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. In fact, not just today, since it happened on the 12th of November. Yeah. Yeah. And I saw you reading, and I'm going to show you reading the, the tribute. Mm. You, you sort of mustered courage and you read it. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, even though I could tell you were hurting as you were reading it. Yeah. Um, for those who don't know, what was your relationship with Chairman Rawlings like? My relationship with Chairman Rawlings was a very principled relationship. Yeah, very, very principled. Even though it was a principled relationship, there was some personal aspect, but that evolved out of that principled relationship. You know, I mean, our chemistry worked because I am very committed to my philo political philosophy and likewise him, and work before play, you know. So I wouldn't say I had too much personal relationship with him, even though we had interacted quite a lot, but a lot of it was on business, and we understood it on that. So who discovered who? <clears throat> was it you who found him, <clears throat> or he who found you? In fact, it's both ways, because uh, it all started... I was already political while in the secondary school, so I entered the university quite political. And while in the university, I belonged to political groups that were progressive, I would say progressive inclined. And June 4th happened when I was just about to leave the university. 
Okay, so before June 4th happened, I was already politically mature. And we took up June 4th. The students, progressive students. Good. We took up the June 4th. <clears throat> in fact, University of Cape Coast in particular, at that time there were three public universities. Legon, Tech, that's... Uh, Kumasi. Uh -huh, and then University of Cape Coast. We had already, the students had already been engaged uh, or had already been engaging a champion's administration in terms of student uh, strikes and demonstrations. So the universities each time were closed. So by the time we got to the fourth year, the academic year had been disrupted. And that was what led to the two-year national service to kind of get some of the students to mark time for it, for it to correct so itself. So you have a that problem for us. <laughs> because when I finished well, secondary school, I had to wait for two years to go to the for, university. It was for, for, for the better Ghana, so to, you know, it was for the better Ghana. It was not just for mischief. So in 1979, who were some of your contemporaries as student activists? Okay, Mr. Tutubi Kwachi was my mate and colleague. And he was our student representative council president for the university. Wow. Then. After, after he served his term, he won the elections for uh, NUCS, NUCS president. NUCS president. Because in those days, the NUCS rotated. Yeah, that's right. So he was SRC president. After his term. And then people, he became NUCS president. Yeah, that's right. Wow. Yeah. Then, uh, this time now, my colleague, you know, who is my senior partner in the law firm now, Mr. Yao Opoku, was also a political colleague. We were mates, you know, but he, <coughs> he was, we were also... The, we all, we, he was also in the progressive political group, you know. And then the former uh, CDR organizer of Northern Region, Mr. Alaji Ibrahima, who later became the mayor of Tamale, two terms. He too is one, you know. There are quite, quite a number, and I wouldn't, you know. So what, what did you people believe? Progressive students in the 70s, Rawlings comes in with this mutiny, what, what were you fighting for? We're fighting against, one, corruption in public service. We're fighting against uh, the ordinary person being taken for granted. We're for fighting against unequal distribution of national resources. You see? And uh, we were, as, at that time also, anti-apartheid struggle was at its peak. So all the campuses were very anti apartheid In fact, I will tell you, when I was a student, Tabo Mbeki was always on our campus. He was moving with my colleagues who were student leaders. He was then in exile in Ghana, Tabo Mbeki. Learning the dark arts of insurrection. Learning the dark arts of insurrection from... Oh, no, no, <laughs> no. no, no. At, at the time, you, you guys hadn't even done, the, the thing hadn't been done yet. No, 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 no. He was in exile in Ghana. In exile in Ghana. I see. Yeah. Uh, his, his colleagues that he was moving around with were student leaders, uh, like uh, John Ekwajo, who one time was our ambassador to uh, Togo, and then Jana Penton, your senior in, okay. in journalism. They were, they, they, so, they were contemporaries of so Tabo Beki. We see Jana Penton is, is also a, a progressive? Very, very. Is that why he keeps the beard? I don't uh, Well, <laughs> keeping the beard is not synonymous with being a progressive. You can be clean shaven and still be a progressive. But well, most of you had beards. Most of you were wearing Achimota sandals. Most of you would never wear a suit. Most of you, you look, you, I don't know whether it was part of the, the, the description. You, you look some way. No, it was, you see, the point is, being a progressive, you don't make fetish of it. Mm. No, it's not a religion, it's not a cult. It's just some principles. Okay? The only thing is that you are fighting or you are solidarizing with the ordinary person. You are mm. solidarizing with the ordinary person. So you're, up, you're put out. Mm. You're, the way you carry yourself should not bring a gap between you and the person that you are solidarizing with. But that is not to say that, <coughs> you know, being a progressive is anti you looking good, anti you looking, you know, wearing nice suits and so on and so forth. No, it's not, that's not it. I, it's, it looks like 
you still can't. <laughs> no, I'm, 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 I'm just fascinated. So I'm going to show a few things. But you are PND secretary for the Northern region. Yeah. And I'm told historically you are the youngest mm -hmm. of the secretaries. So this mm -hmm. was probably in your 20s. Yes. And then you became secretary for trade and industry before no. secretary for... No, no. I was... <clears throat> or trade and what? I was, I was first secretary for Northern region. Mm -hmm. You know, for, from 1982 mm -hmm. to 1988. Mm -hmm. Then I was moved to Accra to li labor and social welfare, which was rechristened as mobilization and social welfare. Okay. It still took care of its traditional core business, except that the national mobilization program was added to that ministry. And at that time, the PNDC under the chairmanship of Jerry wanted to change the psyche that the ministry should not only be dealing with labor unrest mm -hmm. and the, you know trade unions, Congress, and so on. But it should be progressive in terms of job creation because the National Mobilization Program, after it was able to evacuate the Ghanaians who were deported from Nigeria and they had settled in their villages and towns, what did next? And the government, too, the economy was, had gone down. So government could not provide all the jobs needed. So there was the need to create jobs. And we, you know, we formed some organizations known as Mobi Squads. Who some of them went into farming, into tree planting, into cocoa. That, and that year too was the year we had serious drought. So a lot of the cocoa trees had fire, fire, fire had, you know, bushfires had uh, consumed them. So wow. the government brought in fresh cocoa seedlings, improved cocoa seedlings. So some of them went into cocoa plantation and the like. But they were known as Mobi Squads. So that is how, why the name was converted from labor and social welfare to mobilization and social welfare. You keep using the word principles. All of you keep talking about principles. What, what, what were the principles? The principles, as we said, one, accountability. If you are in public service, please, the people have vested their trust in you. Do just that. Don't use it for personal aggrandizement. Mm -hmm. There should be accountability. Mm -hmm. Yes. Then also, you, the ordinary people should also feel that they are part of society. Mm. They are also part of society. The fact that he or she may not be as wealthy as A or B does not mean that he or she is less a Ghanaian. Of course, these are ideals. We don't, you know, we were not naive to say that we were going to perfect that with, no. Society moves and keeps moving. Okay, President Rawlings came in. When he came in, he was larger than life. But today he's no more. Does it mean that society st ends there or stops there? So you come, do your part. But just make sure that whatever one is leaving behind can serve as a foundation stone for the next to build upon. That's how society moves. So you're one of the people who's done PNDC, NDC, and you are still there. You are the first general secretary of the party. One of the things we, we, we are fascinated about is how NDC has become such a strong political party, competing against a party which antecedents is probably 1948, right? Mm -hmm. So you were secretary for this labor mobilization mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. and then who decided that you should become the general secretary? Well, the point is, before that, <coughs> when, bef during the revolution, there's the PNDC, Provisional National Defense Council, there were some structures that were created to help anchor the revolution and propel it. And they were known as revolutionary organs. We had the, first we had the People's Defense Committee slash Workers' Defense Committee. In the communities, we had the People's Defense Committees. In the workplaces, we had the Workers' Defense Committees to allow lower level you know, staff to also take part in management in deciding the fate of the company. So, you know, as at that time, the PNDC came in, there were still a lot of state-owned enterprises. <coughs> so, we all, uh, later, the PDC, WDC was converted to Committees for Defense of Revolution. 
And we also had, as I already mentioned, the National Mobilization Program. We had the NYO's National Youth Organizing Commission to mobilize the youth, you know. And then we had the DYLG, Democratic Youth League, League, youth League of Ghana, all to kind of inculcate this philosophy in the young. That is nationalism, mm. honesty, transparency, and so on and so forth. And of course, apartheid was still reigning to put it in them about the African struggle. I remember in those days when they were coming to read the news, and please, my guys, if you can find it for me, <laughs> there was this thing they played before the news where they are singing the National Pledge, and then they show Rawlings carrying some things with some people mm -hmm. on some train track with mm -hmm. some macho, mm -hmm. cleaning some gutters mm -hmm. and then doing some cocoa thing. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure that was part of the idea. To What, what was that? And this was about G GBC News. Yeah. I wish I could find it and show it. It's, some, okay. it's I, like, so I promise on my honor mm -hmm. to be faithful. Mm -hmm. And then Rollins will be carrying Good. some things. Was that, what, what was that? It was to instill nationalism mm. in the average Ghanaian for us to love our country. Mm. Yes, for us to love our country. Because the road that Ghana had passed mm. through up to the point of the June 4th and 31st December was not something that was quite interesting and I don't pray we get back to that. Because the country got to a situation where inflation was in three digit figures. And I believe, you know, someone who has an idea in public finance or even just finance in general, any inflation that hits three digit figure. <laughs> Hyperinflation, Good. we are finished. Good. There, was, there had been a lot of money printing, so there was excess liquidity. That will help itself was also helping to fuel the inflation. At the same time, we're deceiving ourselves in terms of fixed exchange rate of $1 to 1.15 CDs. Meanwhile, the black market was about $1 to 40 CDs. General shortages. Our bridges had collapsed, roads had collapsed, the cocoa could not be brought up, out from the hinterland, taken to the harbors to be exported out. So we could not pay for our fuel import bill. We were importing from Nigeria. We, we owed. So you would see <laughs> over, to, over 200 yards or meters of vehicles at filling stations packed for days. What is it? Fuel. No fuel at the filling stations. So they will pack for days until they are able to get, you know, they, uh, they are able to get their next supply, and they ration. Mm. They were rationing, and that was when Ghanaians became so ingenious that because they didn't know when the next supply of fuel would come, they would put stones. <laughs> so I will come. I'll put this is my stone and wow. go home. The next person will put his stone. We'll, and we were very very disciplined about that. The following day we come and we are following. The so this is early eighties. Early eighties. But it started in the 70s. Mm. It started in the 70s. It was just that in the early 80s, it had sharpened. Was, so, was, what, and I'm sorry, I'm making this a whole PNDC. And this, did, did you, how disappointed was Rawlings that you couldn't get money from Russia, from China, and from all these left leaning countries that we thought were going to help us? Because don't forget at the time as well, when the history of the Cold War, now, a lot of these countries that had leaders that we thought would support the type of thinking we had, essentially, he had to be convinced to go to the IMF, which was a so-called neoliberal Western creation. Mm. Tell me the thinking, and wh wh how difficult was it to convince Rawlings that, Charlie, we have to go to IMF? Well, the point is, it was not as if there was that idealism that the moment you go to the East, they're just going to pour the money in, you know, into your hands. No. They had also struggled to build the little resources that they had. And their country was not yet out of the woods. Okay? Because a number of the countries in the East were still a step backward, a step behind the Western world. And they were then, the two were then competing. And of course, remember, there were blockades between the two. You know, I mean, the two uh, systems. Okay. So it's not that they did not support. They, they did their widow's mites. But of course, 
they could not have offload we couldn't have offloaded all our problems onto them because they also still had their people to deal with are you with me and we were members of IMF World Bank since the you know independence but it must have been embarrassing going back to them to say now we want to be on a program we are going to subscribe to your no. conditions we are going to um, I mean, you know what, what the, an IMF program means, right? You, you have to be draconian in some of your cuts. You have to balance the books in the way that they want. And some of the things they, they would ask you to do, the so-called people that you wanted to support with subsidies and things, were not going to benefit from those things. But the point is that subsidies, subsidies, is that the, is, 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 subsidies in general, is that the, right, the, the, the best way to go? Of course, the vulnerable people, certain sections will need to be, you know, but we cannot, as a developing country, just be relying on subsidy, subsidy. Because something has to, you, there some, something has to create the no, resources. I know, I'm saying, but at that time, that wasn't the thinking. What you're no, saying no, now is no, the thinking, but in no, those days, it was not. No, 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 that's, that was not, that was, that's, that's not exactly right. There was, so even then, you agree that you should go, are, are you telling me that there wasn't a debate in cabinet over whether going for the IMF was a there, defeat there, of the revolution's no, no, ideals? No. There was a debate. Of course, in every situation, you will have have two contending you know, uh, this, uh, mm -hmm. uh, minds, okay? There was a debate, uh, you know, those who thought that, look, hey, it's, we, the situation in which we are, we will need to go to World Bank IMF. Then there were also another school of thought that thought total mobilization, you know, total mobilization. So there were these two contending, you know, uh, uh, views. Uh, views you know? Okay. Yes. We'll take a short break. This is the point of view. We're talking to Alaji Hudu Yaya. We're reflecting on Rawlings, and today is the day he was buried. When I come back, I'll show you some excerpts of the uh, program that was held today and the role he played, and also talk about the evolution from JJ to Papa J, because it was from JJ, Chairman Rawlings, to President Rawlings, ex President Rawlings, to Papa J. That must have been four years. And Hudu Yaya is one of the few people who understand that whole dynamic more than most people. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Introducing new sunlight two-in-one. It gives you burst after burst, after burst of long lasting freshness. New sunlight two in one for burst after burst of long lasting freshness. By law, in Ghana, classes of vehicles have maximum speed limits which drivers should observe. The maximum speed loaded heavy goods vehicles should travel is 75 km per hour. In the case of buses, passenger carrying vehicles or unloaded heavy goods vehicles, the maximum speed should be 80 km per hour. Saloon cars and light vehicles are not supposed to travel more than 100 km per hour. Agricultural vehicles should not travel more than 30 km per hour. In all cases, Drivers should drive at a lower speed if the environmental conditions require the vehicle to be driven at a lower speed. Stop road crashes now. Stay alive. This road safety education is brought to you by the National Road Safety Authority. Welcome back. This is still the Point of View special edition um, on the life of former President George John Rawlings, His Excellency, buried today at the military cemetery not far from Burma camp. Guest earlier on, I had Inchi Boisiako Sechere, who is a former minister for many things, Eastern Region, Labour, one of the leaders of the ACDRs and the CDRs. Later on, I'll be speaking to another of the cadres, but that's in the last part of the show. And he's called uh, Winfred Osei. He also has some interesting reflections on Rollins. But I have Alaji Hudu Yaya, one of the, the closest people to him. Alaji, I wanted to show you 
sorry to remind you if it's painful. I'm going to show you the tribute read by Amina. I think she's the last daughter. But this is the tribute of the wife, mm -hmm. which she read. And um, just to show viewers who didn't see how it was. So here's a quick flavor of that. After the 1981 December Revolution started, with all the difficulties of running a collapsed state, I saw less of you due to your schedule. When the restructuring and reconstruction took off, improvements to the national economy were clearly visible, and I would bring the girls over to visit on weekends and fortnightly. They never could hold back their excitement. When Amina and Kimathi were born, my work with the rural and urban communities intensified. You made me your eyes and ears to what was going on around the country. You trusted in the integrity and an astutement and astuteness of our women folk to give a good assessment of the reality on the ground. With your help and support, we were able to make the fight for women and children's rights a reality with the passing of the interstate succession laws, family accountability laws, and all the other laws passed on behalf of Ghanaian women and children. They are a testament to your concern for your nation when you were made aware of the difficulties women were facing in the country. You never hesitated to help with the passing of laws to protect the vulnerable and the voiceless. From 1983 to 1992, I worked assiduously on empowering the Ghanaian women. I knew my passion to transform the lives of women could become a reality. I had dreams of improving lives of the urban poor communities through women, but it still remained a dream since I could do nothing without passing through the people's defense, who, by the way, totally disagreed with my style. So that was uh, Amina Rawlings reading the tribute of the wife. I decided to please to ask you, can we really understand Rawlings if we don't talk about his wife? Because even listening to the tribute, they were moving you from personal to policy, from home to castle. It's almost like she was dead throughout. Is, every, is that what it was? The, in terms of, she wasn't just a first lady sitting in the house. She knew what the policy was. She understood what the man was trying to do. And even though she didn't have an official role in government, I sense that she probably, her views were probably more important than a lot of people would, would have known externally. Well, <clears throat> one thing I know is that she was quite political. Mm. And, pro and progressively political. Mm. There is, you can see some of the areas she engaged herself in. The fight for uh, the fight for gender equality. You know. So she took up for herself instead of just sitting at home mm -hmm. as a you know housewife. To complement the you know the efforts of the revolution, and especially the women you know in the women's side, you know I mean uh, in the revolutionary time she was not sitting in cabinet no she wasn't sitting in cabinet she she was very much on her 31st December women and of course she taught the country very much just like the husband she used to really go to the rural areas. Then the first thing they helped, I mean, building bakeries for women, for them to engage themselves in income generating activities, uh, uh, agriculture, you know, setting up day nurseries and so on and so forth. So in the course of this, obviously, challenges that women faced came to her, 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 you know, her, to her knowledge. And some of them would would, in, would, would wish that mm. something that, you know, be done positively. You know, what kind of revolution is it that can marginalize one section of society? For example, this interstate succession law 111. They, you know, she played a role. I mean, when I say play a role, not just personal, but through her organization, because they came face to face with some of the challenges. I mean, a, a woman, completes her widowhood, and sometimes some of them are denied of any portion of the estate or even mm. unequitable, unequitable portion of the widow or of the estate. Then family accountability law, that is head of family, 
<laughs> the head of families, the property that uh, uh, belongs to the family, he thinks that he must use it or he can use it without accountability. You know. So these were some positive things that came out of her, mm -hmm. of, of her engagement with the revolutionary process. But post-revolution into democracy, she became more prominent within the NDC. The point is, she was, I must say, I must say that, yes, she has been a foundation member of the party. Uh, she had been a foundation member of the party, I must say. And uh, later, she contested for a position, you know, that's national vice chairperson of the party. Of course, she had a right, why not? She was, uh, uh, you know, if you, uh, what should I say? Uh, she was uh, uh, a dues, you know, pay a member. A fee pay member. Okay, a fee pay in member. In good standing. In good standing, okay. So, what, what, because she was a woman, because she was a wife of, you know, no, she contested and she was voted for, mm -hmm. you know, in Tamale, 2010, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. Her relationship with NDC has been quite difficult. For, for viewers who are wondering, page 42 and 43 of the program, I'm sure we'll show you some of that. Mm -hmm. That's where her, tri her tribute is. I wanted to show you quickly part of Zanetto's tribute. Mm -hmm. um, for those of us who don't, are not, we, we sense that he's very proud of Zanetto Rawlings. We get that sense when we see the way he relates with her. So I'm just going to show you some of his, um, what, what she said about the, the dad. Then I'll show your own tribute. You and mom would always ensure that you visited during the term. And in my case, Amina's case, I beg your pardon, you would regale her friends with stories about the time in Achmota and the mischief that you got up to. You mastered every aircraft that you flew defying gravity with each flight. Your flying gave you the eyes of an eagle and added dimension to your perspective on the situation on the ground, literally. Even among the clouds, you were a master of the skies. Your skill as a pilot was so well and pur purposeful, yet never giving way to fearless recklessness, fully understanding that an element of fear is a requirement to anticipate danger never sub succumbing to the mundanity of life. You raised us to challenge the ordinary and to push beyond our comfortable boundaries. You taught us to stand up for those who could not, even at the risk of standing alone. We were never too young or too small to be privy to your thoughts, which you shared on world politics, on the inequity of the world economic system. On the so that was Zanetto. Ajima Rawlings tribute. I know a lot of you politicians try and keep your families away from politics. Um, what do you make of the, the way she's become a formidable, respected politician in the front line? Well, I don't know where you've gotten this theory from <laughs> that politicians keep their families away from politics. Some, some of you people, <laughs> not all. Because if you are a progressive, if it's first first with your family. Mm. You try to get your family progressive, to understand, because you're fighting against iniquities. Okay? And how do you change society? If you do not, if, if you do not recruit, you know, more into your fold in terms of the ideas that you believe in, who are you going outside to go and recruit or to... Uh, who are you going outside to get to understand what you stand for? Yeah. So that is in accordance with revolutionary principles. Mm. That your family must understand. And they must be part of the struggle. Mm. You see? And, and, and to feel that, oh, these are children, they don't understand. No, no, no. It's very, it's very, it's very reactionary. To say that, oh, this is a woman, that's not her business. It's very reactionary. Mm. Yes, because we are all human beings. And exploitation does not know sexual boundaries or age boundaries. Mm. So the earlier you got people conscious, the better. Okay. Let's go to your, the tribute from the NDC, which you read. And viewers, that's on page 238 to 241. So quite a long tribute. And I just want to show you the man who read it. <laughs> it is appropriate to state here that His Excellency President Jerry John Rawlings 
signed the party's manifesto with his blood at who to signify the deep faith he had in the party to the principles which he believed in. Indeed, many of the persons that served in these administrations of the AFRC and PNDC have held different positions in the NDC and are still loyal members of the party. The role of President Jerry John Rawlings as the founding father of the NDC is immortalized by Article 5 of the NDC Constitution and states the founding father of the National Democratic Congress is Flight Lieutenant Jerry John Rawlings, upon whose vision and leadership the party was established. On the completion of his two terms as president in the Fourth Republic, President Jerry John Rawlings took up the position of the chairman of the Council of Elders of the party and did not stop advising and admonishing the party until his unfortunate passing on November 12, 2020. As a party, his death is difficult to bear, and a huge vacuum has been created that will be difficult to fill. For, to fill. But we are consoled by the fact that his legacy of establishing the most enduring democracy in the, count, in the history of the Republic of Ghana bears testimony to the principles and values that pushed him into the political life of Ghana. So that was uh, Elijah Huri, I am my guest for this part of the show. Um, somebody said to me they, they knew you were the one who was going to read the <laughs> tribute. I don't know how the person knew that you were going to read it. But when they said NDC tribute, they said Huri, I was going to read it. I mean, who asked you to read? I'm just trying to get a sense of, in terms of who you are in the party, it was a natural thing for them to make you read it, right? Well, the leadership of the party, the leadership of the party decided that I should read. There have been write-ups about you describing you as a... a okay, when, they, when they talk about NDC factions in the past, they said you were a party loyalist and a Rawlings loyalist. And in, in a few publications, do you understand when people say that? <laughs> As in, there was, was a fancy group, there's the, this group, there were many specific names. And they said, you, you asked for you, you are because Rawlings and Party. The point is, first and foremost, how did it all start? It all started from the idea, from the principles, from the values. Mm. So... If we are committed to these principles and values, then what should divide us should be those against the principles or those for the principles. Mm. Any other, any other factors that should divide us, no, then we have deviated. We've, we've come, we've talked about fighting for the ordinary person. We've talked about fighting against disease. We fight, we've, we've talked about fighting against ignorance. We've talked against, we've talked, we, we, we've set for ourselves a task of fighting against lack of accountability in public office. We've talked, we've set for ourselves building a society that is meritorious and not based on clanism. That is because we are from the same tribe, we are from the same religion, we are from the same village. But no, based on competence. These are very clear. So why should it now be according to certain other subjective factors? That, that, is, that, that is my principle. So you are for the party, and, but, but you were also a Rollins guy. Yes. Because some people fell out with him. Well, the point is, it's not that I decided that I, you know, I should fall out with him or I shouldn't fall out with him. It was the principle. Principles that he believed in and principles that I believed in was what got us together working. Mm. That doesn't mean that it was all seamless. There were obviously some rough edges once in a while because nothing is perfect in society. You cannot, we cannot always agree on the, same, on, the same, on the same issue. But of course, if on matters of principle, that if principle is what binds us together, when we come face to face with a contradiction, Yes, you should have your say, I should have my say. 
but I should be able to convince you, you should be able to convince me. It's not about anger, it's not about fighting, it's not about ego, that actually you never make mistakes. You, you are not playing God. Mm. That is how revolutionaries are supposed to think. But you are loyal not just to the ideas, but also to him. Well, the point is leadership. Leadership. Okay? You just don't go, you just, I mean, there, when you, uh, you have sets of ideas to implement, okay, the goal is there. But how you get there, you will need to draw tactics and strategy. And that is why they must always be leaders. There must always be leadership. Mm. Okay. I wouldn't oppose just for the sake of opposition. That if President Rawlings were out today, he would tell you. Some people say I speak calmly, but he will tell you that even with that disposition, I am not a person who will keep quiet on matters of principle. Mm. You see, but the point is leadership is also very important. Like in your organization over here. Definitely you will have some who work under you. You also have some who you look up to. Mm. Yes. It is based on how you approach issues. You mm. approach issues based on the objective or the goal that you have in mind. Okay? I don't know if I, if I make myself I get, clear. I get yes. that point. You know, so that is always the deciding factor. Mm. That is always, for me, the deciding factor. And it's not only just President Rollins. But I've worked with a lot of other people, you know, who have been my bosses, you know, before. I mean, uh, who, are, who are also, who were also, or who are also higher than me before, you know, and Rollins being our, our overall boss then, you know. And I'm saying that, one, I'm a Kida. Kidership is discipline. Mm. It's discipline. And the discipline in respect of the objectives that you have set to achieve. I, 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 I would mean, mm. yeah. So if you say that, I, it, it does not mean that for all the years I've worked with him, we've never had, diff, you know. What, what will NDC be like without him? The point is, well, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I would say that Jesus Christ of blessed memory died over 2,000 years ago. That what he lived for is still on. Muhammad, peace be upon him, died 1,600 years. And what he lived for is still on. The point is, we just have to, I mean the party will just have to stick to the principles and values that he left behind for us. And for us, to be very, very frank with each other, very objective with each other. Mm. Yes, frank with each other, objective with each other, you know, in terms of the objectives that, for which the party was formed. Mm. Yes. I mean, uh, if, if you take, uh, in fact, uh, uh, President Mama has been advising the party that there are parties who don't have founders today and they've managed to survive. There are others who have, don't have founders and they have failed to survive. So he was, he's always been cautioning that we should stick to the values and the principles you know, for which the party was formed. So that, that is the common thing, the common binding force with, you know, amongst members. And then, as I said, also discipline. We, you know, in discipline is where you have an clickism forming cliques within mm -hmm. organization, in not only party, but even churches, you can even see, you know, mm -hmm. yes, fighting against cliqueism. The main line should be, what is the objective that brings you together? What are you fighting for? Are you fighting for yourselves or you are fighting for the collective mm -hmm. good of society? Let's talk about the evolution finally, how he ended. So from JJ to chairman, PNDC, NDC, two terms, president, hands over, um, Former president under Kufo, under Mills as well, and then Mahama. And now I watch Akufuado's tribute to him. And I see that evolution in the, in the tribute. How do you suppose he changed as a person from revolutionary young fighter to 
I think the last time we saw him was in his mother's funeral, calmly receiving guests, cracking jokes and things. What do you make of that, that kind of evolution? Well, the point is that, tell me who doesn't change. You see, uh, society is dynamic. Mm. And if you refuse to acknowledge that, you'll be swept away by history. Mm. And of course, we all also are growing each day, day in, day out, and we imbibe the lessons of history. I, I, you, you, follow, you follow that. Uh, the time of the revolution, like I told you, the conditions in the country are not the same as today. Like, when we're queuing for kinky, can you believe? We're queuing to buy kinky. I know. Did you ever queue? I'm too young to queue, but I had, <laughs> I, I had kinky bought in a queue. Good, that's so right. So that should be good enough. Good. 1983, <laughs> I had come from the north for, a, in fact, that was when we were discussing the economy to decide which way to go, the, to start the ERP, the Economic Recovery Program. So it was a very long meeting. From about 10 a.m., we closed at 8.30 p.m. Wow. And we were then kept at the state house. We, those who had come from outside, outside Accra. Accra. Yeah. When we got there, there was no food. Because <laughs> state house itself could not even get rice to cook for us. <laughs> the people in the ERP meeting didn't get food to eat. That was, that was to tell you the situation that the country <laughs> were not preparing to, you know, so you can see that wow. you needed to take pragmatic measures. So if the hunger in the night will let you think faster. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so we, of course we couldn't sleep with that, with that hunger. Wow. I was with Mr. John and Deboguri. John Akbaribo? Yeah, Akbaribo. So he was the secretary for the upper region, <laughs> and I was there for northern region. So we decided that, look, we'll go to Osu and look for Kinki. <laughs> we went to Osu, no Kinki. Wow. Then the Osu, some people directed us to go to La. We went to La, no Kinki. Then La also directed us to Teshi, a particular place. We went there, no Kinki. Then Teshi also <laughs> directed us to Nungwa. <laughs> you end up in Tem. <laughs> <laughs> Nungwa. And when we went there, they, they directed us to a particular house and a particular woman that by all means she would have. And that was also when there was a people's shop where maize was being allocated to Kenko producers. And the number of balls they could produce per bag was... <laughs> yeah, it just were, were that bad. Wow. So we went there, we met this queue. Of course. You are members we, of the Economic Recovery Program. No, we have not yet formed the Economic Recovery Program. But we you have, we, we, secretaries. We, yeah, yeah, we're secretaries. Now in, the, pro in, the, pro in the process. Nungwa. Yes. That was a situation with that Ghana I hope you didn't cross the queue. Who, who were, those days, how could you? <laughs> when we were preaching equality and so on, we joined the queue. <laughs> You know, and we finally bought the kenke. Some people could not wait for the boiled kenke. They bought the raw kenke to go home and boil. Semi-cooked kenke. You know? Wow. So, so this is the situation. In great, I've interviewed, he has never told me this thing. I have to call him and ask <laughs> maybe, him maybe why he kept this story from Maybe me. he forgot. Maybe he's forgot. It's been a long time. Maybe he... This is 1983. Yeah. I, I can remember. Maybe he... he you were the secretary me. for the North. Yes. And he was secretary for Upper. Upper, yeah. And you moved from State House to Nungwa. For, yes, yes. How many balls did you get? Oh, we bought... I think we bought two. So at this time, you, you get fish or pepper? We didn't ask for that. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't wow. ask for that. So Ghana yeah. was in a serious situation. Yes. And, and then, of course, you, it was not like you could buy as many balls as you want. It was being rationed so that everybody could so get something. So you look something. at your face you can eat only two. <laughs> Take two and go. <laughs> you know? Wow. Yes. So, so wow. yeah, these are, these are some of the realities that mm. the country, you know, pa passed through. Mm. And the, you cannot just come out with a straight jacket ideas in your head that this is how I'm going to solve this problem or this is how I'm going to cross the bridge when you haven't gotten to the bridge yet. Mm. It's great stuff. Let's deal with two final things. A lot of, Nana Kufado said, history will be kind to him. President Kufo said he will have a balanced place in our history. I get the sense a lot of people are struggling with whether to put him positive or negative or neutral because of some of the excesses of the revolution. We are not God, so we can't judge. But my question to you is, based on everything you know, where should we place him? Definitely on the positive side of history. <clears throat> you clearly can see. I mean, he, he, he had been true to what he said, that 
he was embarking on a revolution where they, you know, and wanted the country to reorganize itself econ socially, economically, politically. <clears throat> he achieved that. We have the Fourth Republic, the most enduring, mm -hmm. the most enduring democratic face of our country's development. Mm -hmm. There is one. After his two terms, he never made any attempt to revise the to constitution mm -hmm. and stay, you know, <clears throat> more than the two terms. The economy had been turned around. Now, I mean, we used to have fixed exchange rate, as I said before, and business people could only could only bring in their raw materials by going to Ministry of Finance to apply for import licenses. Now you don't need that. But we had to go through that before, you know. And look at our, our roots were, were very, very terrible. In fact, when we came in, before the, you know, we, we, the ERP started, around 1983, 84, thereabout, the first roots that the PNDC tackled were the Kumasi roots. And we didn't have the foreign exchange mm. to bring in foreign contractors to undertake those projects for us. Under Rawlings, some strategy was devised, known as a, a butter trade system, with some of these progressive countries, where we sit down, we negotiate projects. We have the cocoa, which is locked up. We can give them that quantity of cocoa, and then equal to the am amount of project that they are supposed to execute for us. So we were entered into that with the East German company known as Limex Bau. And they did. At that time, I mean, at the beginning of the revolution, the Kumasi rules were really terrible. But this company, Limex Bau, an East German company, they did a good job. And I can bet you that a lot of the parts of Kumasi, the rules are still good. Wow. Again, a lot of uh, uh, communities did not have doctors. Mm. And we could not train doctors overnight. We had only two medical schools. That is uh, Kolebu and then Kumasi Tech. And yet, a lot of our rural people, farmers, were, did not have access to health or to doctors. The p patient to doctor ratio was very, very high, higher than what World Health Organization recommended. So again, through this barter trade system, the country was able to enter into negotiations with the Cubans so that they brought in their doctors, and then part of it was, you know, catered for through this better system. Thank you for talking mm. to us. We wish you well, mm. and you. we wish you long life and strength. Thank that you. was Alaji Huduyaya, mm. uh, former founding general secretary of the NDC, uh, secretary for many portfolios under PNDC, vice chairman of NDC formerly, and of course, now just a big man. <laughs> in the town. <laughs> when we come back, I'll speak to another person briefly. Winfred Osse is a former cadre. He's also somebody who has some of the story from the 80s, part of the people who worked for the CDRs and the WCDRs or the WDRs. Is that what the name is? No, no, WDCs. The, the WDCs. A lot of titles. Mm -hmm. WDCs. Mm -hmm. When we come back, we'll talk to he Winfred. Was, he was the first chairman. First chairman of, of what? Uh, the CDR. Uh, the, um, uh, in, uh, in Tema. In Tema, yes. Yeah, he used to work at Gassem in Tema. Mm -hmm. We'll talk to him when we come back. So there's a lot more special Rollins tribute show. Don't go away. Still trying to pay tribute to former President Jerry John Rawlings by understanding his evolution. And one of the things we want to do today is to 
find out people who were around the revolution, late 70s, early 80s, all the way into the mid 90s, because we know there was AFRC rulings, there was PNDC rulings, and there was also NDC rulings. Now, I'm here with um, Winfred Osei, very interesting man. He's a Kader. Uh, he was, some people consider the first deputy propaganda secretary of NDC many years ago. This is into business, but he has a bit of a rolling story to tell us. Mr. Say, thanks for joining us on, on the point of view. Thank you, Bernard. So we're trying to, of course, commiserate and um, remember rolling. So first, of course, con uh, condolences, because I know you are part of the founding group of people who are around him. What are your opening thoughts about the life and the legacy of Rawlings? Rawlings, my leader, my inspirer, may he rest in peace, and my condolences to the family. We are told that even PNDC had a lot of UP elements, Obeda, Samoa, and Co., even Kufu at some point. What was, clearly you were part of the people who are the socialists in the group. So what, what accounted for that shift? to bring in more right-leaning elements into the, the revolution. The rhetoric was anti-imperialist, then also anti the, 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 the elite in society. Okay. And that was also very important because it enabled the rude or the oppressed to rise up and support it. That, this thing. that helped console also, that also had a, a consolidation factor. Jerry was smart in that, that he, he didn't come to do a CPP thing, he didn't come to do a, you know, he wanted. All right. the, the, I just want to find my final point to you. So, what was his, what is his biggest legacy? Okay, Rollins' legacies are very varied. You see, Rollins was, in a way, in my sample to front pressure, mm -hmm. but he unified the people of this country mm -hmm. who, genu who genuinely wanted to develop. Clearly, there were people who were benefiting from the status quo, mm -hmm. and therefore, you know, it was very difficult for those people to work with him. But as long as you didn't belong to that, he was very open, and, and that's how come you realize that he worked with people from all persuasions. Mm -hmm. So in that respect, he was a unifier. He was also a disciplinarian. Mm -hmm. You know, he didn't believe in, you know, blind loyalty. Mm -hmm. He works with you. If you go wrong, he will deal with you. Mm -hmm. how, how come people like his nephew fell, fell, uh, fell foul and he paid the capital price, his school, close friend, mm -hmm. uh, attachment in town, you know, and most of his uh, appointees. I can tell you that even our Tenure of office, myself, who were in charge of the uh, first uh, uh, coordinating committee of the PDCs in Tema, he, 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 he got us investigated when he heard certain things. And he, he investigated and he found out that those things were known. So Rollins will always come to ask for probity and accountability. He gave people the chance to express themselves. You know, if, you, if there were time I was talking about how he, 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 he got me on earth and how we work together and the kind of things that he, you know. Now, I think that a few things need to be, you know, Rollins was a type that had, you know, a down, uh, up approach and then a top bottom up approach, bottom up approach, and he had information from both ends. So you couldn't play around with him. His ministers that he, you know, uh, appointed were always on the tetan hose because it isn't what you said alone. For whatever you say, he has about two other sources to, to, to cross-check. <laughs> so you had, the, the, you, you could see the, uh, the ministers, the DCEs, those the district secretaries, you had the regional uh, ministers, or regional uh, uh, secretaries, and then the uh, people in charge of the ministries. That was one line. But you had the ACDRs from the ground. They also had a similar this thing. Then he has his personal, you know. For instance, there was a time when, you know, the TDC had issues with the tenants. Nkuma built the tenant house. He gave it to TDC. TDC was taking care of it. Uh, TDC sold, and then it was a subvented organization. 
and uh, the, I, uh, uh, the internal generated IGR wasn't enough. So having sold about 50% of the GC, uh, having just about half of the stock, they had to always you know, increase the, 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 the rents of, uh, of the tenants anytime they needed more money. Mm -hmm. And it was creating a problem. Can you believe that I approached Rollins on this? Mm -hmm. He told that it wasn't fair. And that it got to a point where, you know, the poor workers in Tema were being harassed and, and they were even being uh, dispossessed. Mind you, earlier on, he had brought in the one man, one house as part of the social justice mantra. So that all state houses, anybody could not take more than one. And that time we had this thing called institutional houses that were being abused. So through the institutional houses, I can form a company and my company can go and take about 20 and see that it's from my, my company and workers. So you had a situation where, you know, this thing was happening. And CDC was putting all its uh, budget on those few houses that were there. So the tenants came to me and I, I went to him and said that we couldn't sustain this thing because it was unfair. Cities have sold all the this and the people, the rich people have bought the houses and then the few people who are salary, you know, they are bedding the, they are uh, taking, they are bearing all the burden of TDC. And he said, okay, so what do we do? And I told him, that, I thought that they should, we should sell the houses to the, uh, the workers. He said, but they don't have money. I said, yes, let us subsidize. Take about 50%. He said, okay. Uh, call Dan. Then he called, he said he would call Dan. He called Dan and asked Dan myself, and I think I should ask, and we met in Tama with Ayi Bunti. And that decision was taken. And today, because of that, a lot of ordinary people own it. So he was that type. You know, you didn't, he, this, this policy didn't come from a minister, it came from the ground. And I'll give you uh, many Sounds examples. Nice example. So he was both connected upwards and downwards. Yes. And it's, policy and his management style, you know, reflected a combination. A lot of things that he did was as a result of some of these ideas from the grassroots and also, and I can give you, you know, for instance, today the only shares mm -hmm. that Ghana has in Cement Works, you know, was as a result mm -hmm. of a certain, you know, when uh, Ghana was divesting uh, uh, its shares in most of the companies. You know, Gassim was previously 80% owned by, by, by government of Ghana and 20%, but gradually the shares. And it was almost, they were selling, going to sell everything. Then the workers of Gassem had then, you know, built up some reserves of their provident fund. So again, I approached him, told him that, say, can't you assist us to also buy uh, some of the shares? And he said, that would be a, a brilliant idea because this is something that he wanted to do for the other people to own, you know, it's okay. How do we do it? Then he said, yes. Uh, he would call Larry Ajete. They had law trust, an investment firm, to, 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 to work with us. So I went and saw Larry. They valued the shares there. They got one investment. Business. They valued the shares there. And our money was short. We then had about those days about four, or 500,000. I'm talking about uh, mid-90s. But then when they did the value, the value, the value of the shares was about one point something. So we couldn't put up the DC. So I went back to Rollins and told said, no, the state will have to subsidize that. that you know. So he took off the DC and gave instruction that the shares must be sold so to do. You know what? The 5% share that Ghana has today, the workers held it for about 10 years. From that low value, the shares appreciated to over 5 million US dollars. Then Kufo comes in and the workers said that they wanted to uh, offload the shares, and Kufo said, I'll buy. And Kufo bought those five shares. For the state. For the states, you know. So that was Rollins for you. So that was uh, Winfred Osei with his own version of his Rollins story. Hope you've um, learned something today, speaking to Intribuisi Akusetre, and of course, um, Alaj Wuduyaya and Winfred Osei, with all the bits you saw from the Independence Square and also getting towards Bema Camp where he was buried. As we say, Thank you for watching. We'll be with you next time. Stay with CTTV. Good night.